Good morning. Happy Thursday. It's good to be with you. Oh my goodness, was it cold out this morning? 42 degrees or something like that. You would think that it would be warmer, but if you look out on the mountains, if you look at Mount Lemon or Rincon Peak, you'll find it is completely covered with snow. So there is quite a bit of cold stuff here in the Vale area. Uh, thanks for joining me this morning. I pray you have a great day. Um, just a few announcements. We have no birthdays today. And as far, I was just sitting here looking at the um, the coronavirus. There's a thing called the Arizona Department of Health Services website, and it kind of shows um, various statistics and parameters from this whole COVID thing. And the one that I like to look at is the hospitalizations. I think I can show this to you. This is um, This is the number of hospitalizations since the beginning of the pandemic, way back in March of last year. We had March 9th, we had three hospitalizations. I remember coming to church. The last time uh, we were at church before the lockdown was on March 20th or March 15th of 2020. And at that point, uh, only three people had been hospitalized in all of Pima County. They said just 15 days to slow the spread. And here we are a year and 10 days later. But if you look, it's we've gone through three phases of the pandemic. This is um, phase one kind of peaked at, uh, or wave one, I guess, July 14th last summer. Wave two was around January 8th, uh, about two months ago. And so my, my prayer is that enough people will be vaccinated so that we can uh, avoid a third wave. All the, the pandemics, they, they appear to come in three waves. You have the first wave, the second really bad wave, and then you have the third wave and the thing is done. So I'm hoping that we can avoid the third wave. It looks like the, the actual number of vaccinations is pretty good. Um, let's see. I think I can show that too. We have, um, this is the state of Arizona. I can probably show Pima County. Pima County is probably more interesting. There's about a million people that live in Pima, Pima County. And so if you look at the number of vaccinations in Pima County, uh, 417 doses, 417,000 doses administered out of 379,000 doses actually ordered, which means that we're getting more doses out of the order than we're getting about 10% more doses. And we've had about 20, 266,000 people, at least one COVID vaccination, 25%. So this is just really exciting. For me, I'm leaning towards that. My understanding is, is that if you are 16 years or older, you can actually, you are now eligible to get a vaccine. Whether or not you can get a vaccine is a different story because some people have different reactions to vaccine. They want a more controlled ability to have a vaccine. Other people are probably not going to get the vaccine. They, they feel like the risk of dying from the COVID is is different than the va than the risk of taking the vaccine, although that vaccine is shown to be very safe. But this, you know, they only had a year to test it. They, <laughs> it may be 5, 10, 15, 20 years before the actual effects of this vaccine may be fully known. I have no idea. But anyway, so there are those people that are not going to get vaccinated. So I, my, my thing is, is within the next, you know, one, two or three or four weeks, we will be at the point that if you've wanted to get vaccinated, you'll get vaccinated. If you don't want to get vaccinated, then the risk is all on you. It's no longer on me as the leader of our congregation. It's all on you, which means that if we start doing things, opening things up and start, you know, taking our masks off to sing and do all that sort of thing. Um, as long as I tell you what's going on, you have to evaluate the risk of what's going on in your own life and, um, so, and that probably, that probably will happen sooner than later. The, the whole purpose of this Bible study is actually to, you know, once we get through Easter and we start gathering in groups again, we start planning towards launch in November. The launch in November, I'm absolutely convinced we'll be out of the pandemic and that we can maximize the use of our resources. Anyway, so... Uh, it's just kind of fun to, to look at it and see that we're actually kind of getting out of this thing, which is just so wonderful. I'll tell you that. Um, we are going to, we are going to go ahead and start. Um, let's see. We are in episode 32 
of our study, Life Changing Connection. And we've got, we've spent 32 days together looking at this. And um, I think that uh, it has been really fun for me. I have no idea about anybody else, but it's been great for me. And we're going to talk about that today, actually, because we're going to, we're going to talk about a topic that churches need to hear and leadership in churches need to hear. We just spent talking about our mission and our vision and what God's called us to do. And now we've been talking about leadership. Well, one of the most important things about leadership is understanding that God gifts each one of us with certain gifts. And then we, we as a congregation, we pool our gifts. We look at what gifts people have. We pool those gifts together. And then we say, how can we use these gifts to forward the mission of God? And that's basically why we exist, because God wants us to make disciples, <laughs> go and make disciples. And so he's given us gifts. And so part of that is just looking around and seeing what gifts we have and then making disciples. I want, to, I want to share with you a story that Jesus told. This is a parable that he told. And we're going to learn a couple important lessons from this parable. So we're just going to look at it. It's Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. It goes like this. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. This is about the kingdom of God. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two bags more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the few things I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have come faithful. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. And his master replied, You wicked, lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more. And they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is a harsh parable from Jesus because this is a person who is in the kingdom, right? This is the kingdom will be like. And he says this parable about the bags of gold. And we typically look at this parable as individuals, like what gifts has God given me and how will I use those gifts to forward the kingdom of God? And that's not a bad way to look at this parable because God does give each of us gifts and we are called to use the gifts that God gives us. And it's it's not just our, our funds, like our money, but it's our time. It's our passion. It's our talents, the the things that God has gifted us with. Each of us have different talents. We looked in Ephesians 4.11 where Paul says some of us are apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds, and some teachers. And we should understand what those giftings are. And if we're really, really good at gifted in one area, then we should move forward in that area. 
And so we're each of us individually are given gifts by God. But also, I like to think of this parable as applying to a congregation. And what is a congregation? At its root, a congregation is a collection of Christians that exist in a particular location at a particular time with particular resources. And because God has blessed that congregation in a particular place in a particular time with particular resources, he expects those congregations to gather together and to use the gifts within that congregation to forward the mission, which is to make disciples. Now, if you don't have a congregation, if you have just one person living on a deserted island, one Christian missionary out in the middle of Africa, well, then you have to maximize the resources that you have, you know, being out there in Africa. Uh, and you have to do discipleship the old-fashioned, the, the, the Jesus way. Let me, I'll call it the Jesus way. The Jesus way and the Paul way. The Jesus way is where he gathered around 12 men and he lived with them for three years and he created disciples that way. That's the Jesus way. That is not a bad way to do discipleship. The Paul way is where Paul went out, he gathered people together, he looked at what resources were in that community, and he established a church in Ephesus. He established a church in Corinth. He established a church in Philippi. He established a church in um, all, all these different places, Colossae and Thessaloniki. And and he, he brought people together. He created the necessary teams he found bishops, you know, he found overseers, he found deacons, uh, he found workers, he found uh, elders, he found all these people and he put them together and he said, okay, this is the mission of the church, move forward in the church. And that's how Paul planted missions. Now, this is so important to us as a church to understand this parable as being that God gifts congregations with resources. And what he expects a congregation is to use those resources, to maximize those resources. Why do people not maximize the resources that they have? And we saw it here in the parable. It's the third, it's the third guy, the, the man. He says, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, Harvesting you have not sown and gathering you have not scattered seed. I was afraid and I hid your gold in the ground. The reason why the third man in this story did not use the resources that God had given him. And it wasn't that he was only given one resource as opposed to the one that was giving two bags of gold or the one that was giving five bags of gold. It has, it. there is it matters not how many bags of gold a church has been given, a congregation has been given. What matters is what they do with it. And they should not they and they shouldn't live in fear. Now, when I look at the church in the United States today and churches that are just declining, um, there is a natural life cycle of a church. A, ch a church is formed together, people are excited, they kind of they, you know, Joe raises his hand and says, I'll do this. And Peter raises his hand and says, I'll do this. And Sally says, I'll do this. And they all kind of get together and they start doing the work of the church and it's all exciting and all that. But then over time, the, the things that they initially decided that they were going to do, maybe they can't find people to do that anymore. Maybe they can't find people that are excited about that particular ministry or that particular way of loving the community or whatever. And so it's time for the church to stop and say, okay, what resources do we have? What people do we have? How can we best maximize to make loving disciples in the community around us? So let's retool and reconfigure and relook and all that sort of thing. And a lot of times churches don't do this. Why? Because they're afraid. They're afraid because they, they're afraid of getting rid of ministries that, that have always existed. They're afraid of doing things in a, do, in a new way. They're afraid that they might anger some people. I mean, th there's a lot of fear in churches. And there shouldn't be fear in churches because God overcomes fear. What does Jesus say? He says, perfect truth casts out all fear. If you, as a church, honestly look 
at what you're doing in any church. If any church would stop and look and look at what they're doing and say, is this the most effective way to make disciples? Are we doing it well? And, and the answer comes back, yeah, we're doing it great. We're knocking it out of the ballpark. This is great. Then great, keep doing it. But if you look at what you're doing and you say, man, we're just, we're just losing ground. We're not doing anything. Um, we're not doing, I shouldn't say that. Because churches are always doing something. But if you're not being good stewards of the resources that God has given you, then the reason why is because you live in fear. Um, I know of a couple churches that, uh, that, oh, they, they, they have church buildings and they, the resources, the number of people, you know, was a large number of people, but it starts to dwindle. You know, when you, when your church numbers start to dwindle, there's a lot of fear, right? It doesn't have to be fear. It can be actually a great, exciting time, but let's say, the number of people start to, to diminish. The number of resources start to diminish. And let's say that you, uh, let's say you have a pastor, right? And the pastor, you know, now the resources are starting to diminish. And the pastor says, uh, the church says, well, we have to have a pastor, right? We, we, we are not church unless we have a pastor. So we have to have a pastor. And the pastor costs X number of dollars. And if we count up all our offerings... Um, and it's it's we we don't have enough to pa- to pay our pastor. Then they start looking around and say, well, well, can we partner with another church and have our pastor part time here and our pastor part time there? And that way we can at least have a pastor. But then we're spreading around that sort of thing. But they they don't do that because of fear. Um, we, or a church may say, you know, let's just stop. Let's you know, let's just regroup. Think of what we can do with the resources that God has given us. And let's just maximize the resources that God, we're right now, we're a one bag church. (laughs) We've only got one bag of gold, but God doesn't want us to hide that gold in the ground. He wants us to do something. How many churches that could say, let's, you know, the the past, let's say there's a church and the pastor's moved on and now they're looking on and they want to call a pastor. They want to, they want to get a new guy in there to lead the congregation. Uh, because right, you're not a pa- you're not a congregation like a pastor, but a congregation can do stuff even if they don't have a pastor. I know that sounds crazy, but you could, you could have some elders in the congregation. You could have some deacons in the congregation. You could have some mature people in a congregation. They look around at the resources that they have. Maybe they have a building, and they say, "Hey, let's use that building to love the community. Let's just have a garage sale. Let's let the community come in and have a garage sale or whatever." Um, we live in a poor community. Let's let's offer child care, free child care. I mean, there, if you don't have to pay a pastor, which is a very expensive thing, by the way, and it's getting more and more expensive because in order to be a pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, of which we belong in, we require eight years of education, four years of college, and then four years of seminary education. So it's eight years of education. And just think about how the cost of education has skyrocketed over the last 30 years, mostly because the available funds to be able to go to college, and we tell everybody they have to go to college, although there's a lot of people who shouldn't go to college, but because the cost of college is so expensive and the cost of seminary is so expensive, by the time a person gets out of seminary, they have spent a lot of resources getting that degree. And so there's a calculation for pastors of how much they should be paid to kind of recoup the costs of that degree. And and so a pastor is a very, very expensive person. Doctors are expensive person. The teachers are expensive people. I mean, they're just, they're, there are people out there that have careers that are very expensive careers because we place a huge burden on how much it costs to educate that person. But could you have somebody with less education and, ha- and have them come and lead your congregation? Could you have a part-time person come and lead your congregation? It, 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 churches need to look churches need to look at what resources they have and say what's the best way to maximize the resources that we have the i have one cardinal rule in my head and that is no church should ever be consistently losing money the, 
if a church is consistently losing money, if you manage your if your household is consistently losing, well, I'm not, not you know retirement something different, but if your household is consistently losing money, losing money, you're doing something wrong. Okay, you're doing something wrong. Every person, every household, every family should look at the money that's coming in and where they're spending that money going out and there should be as much coming in as is going out. I mean, I'm not talking about sometimes it may be, you know, something breaks in the house or something happens, you know, person loses a job or something like that. I'm not talking about the exceptions to the rule. What I am talking about is good stewards are people that look at the resources that God has given them and then they retool and reshape and they adjust the the things they're going to do based upon the resources that they're given. And churches, families do this. I do this. Every, you, you do this. These are things that we should do. And so a church should never, ever consistently lose money. It never should. It me. If a church is consistently losing money, they should cut things. And why don't they cut things? Because they're afraid. It's like, well, we have to have a pastor. We can't have our pastor go part-time. You know, if you are a um, pastor, I'll give you a little secret. Um, when when guys are going into the set, guys, uh, well, in the, in the ELCA, it's guys and girls. But when people are going into the pastoral ministry right now, um, they are being told that the chances of you being a full-time pastor are very, very narrow. So you should consider the fact that when you are a pastor, you might also have to supplement your income with another job because the vast majority of churches across the United States are small churches, less than 50, maybe 50. Or, I think 50% of the churches in the United States are 50 or less. And so they just don't have the resources to have a full-time pastor. So they're being told now, coming out of seminary, it's quite possible you will not be a full-time pastor. And so you you need to consider the fact that you may have to actually go out and work part-time and be a pastor part-time. So if you're a small congregation and your pastor says to you, I do not, I, I'm the pastor, I do not work outside of this role, you must pay me this high wage for 50 people, um, that is a lie. <laughs> the, the church leadership could say to the pastor, we want to be good stewards with the money that God's given us. So we think it's a good idea for you to do something here uh, and, and then be a part-time pastor in our church. And a lot of churches have worked out these deals with their pastors. And um, a lot of these guys go into other social you know, work. Um, some might be, well, I know one was a prison prison chaplain. I mean, there's just lots of, there's lots of positions out there that the pastors can do very, very well. Um, that they're, but, but those decisions have to be made early on. It is hard, you know, the longer you go without adjusting and, and making the changes, the very, very difficult changes that it takes to make sure that the congregation is healthy and moving forward, the harder it is to make these decisions. Which is why a good leader, maybe it's the pastor, maybe it's the board leader, I mean, whoever it is, at some point, somebody should say, wait a minute, are we doing okay um, or do we need to make an adjustment? And a lot of churches, for whatever reason, in the business world, where I came from, you made adjustments quickly because you had to make payroll uh, in the in the. In the church world, for some reason, we just are hesitant about making the necessary difficult decisions in order to move forward. And it breaks my heart because God wants churches to be fruitful and to multiply and to just ma maximize the resources. If, if a church says, you know what, we, um, we can't have you anymore as a pastor, we're sorry about that, and uh, let's, let's let you get a call. There's Plenty of calls a pastor can take, right? I mean, there are there are more churches without pastors that are looking for pastors than there are pastors available. Has been that way pretty much since the beginning of churches, um, because pastors. Um, well, that's a different story, but 
you could go to your pastor and say, listen, we can't afford you, but we're going to continue on as a congregation and we're going to do as much as God allows us to do. And then, you know, we're going to, we're going to, because once the building's paid for and the land's paid for, the, the cost of that is very low. And, you, the, you know, <laughs> there's so many ways to engage in the community around you. I just, this, but it's, it's people live in fear. People just live in fear. It's very, very hard. It's very, very difficult. I'm not saying that it's not difficult, but we should be more afraid of this last sentence. For whoever has this will be given more. They will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even when they have, will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth has nothing to do with how many bags of gold were given to that servant. Has everything to do with what that servant did with the gold they were given. So the role of a congregation, the role of our church, Christ within Veil, is to just look and see what resources we have and say, how can we maximize what God's blessed us with? And God has blessed us with so much. We have land, we have facilities, we have people, we have so much going for us. The, if if we wanted to, I mean, we're not going to do this, but I will just say, for instance, the, the building that we just built, um, the, the mortgage payment on that is a whole lot less than if we wanted to just go out into the open market and just rent that out to some organization to say, you can have 100% use of that building for the next 10 years or the next year at X number of dollars a year. That rental rate would more than pay for the mortgage payment. We won't do that. But what I'm saying is, is that there are a lot of resources that churches have. <laughs> there are tons of resources. Just having land and property and facilities is a tremendous resource. Um, now, it does cost money to maintain. And if the building hasn't been maintained for the last 20 years, then it costs money to overhaul and, and that sort of thing. But it's a whole lot less than you know, starting from scratch and starting from new. We have invested as a congregation so much time, passion, energy, resources into our facilities that it is a huge blessing. It's a huge blessing. And it's more than enough to do incredible ministry in the Vale area. More than enough. And it has, I will tell you though, that the last 15 years, getting to this point has taken a tremendous amount of time for a lot of people. And... The other, the other side of it is that we should never, ever, f God never tells us how rapidly we should deploy ministry. Like how fast are we growing loving disciples? He just says, do it. And you can grow a loving disciples by planting seeds. You can grow a loving disciple by sprouting these seeds. You can grow a loving disciple by just taking people in your congregation and helping them grow deeper in their faith. If a person moves from a, you know, from, if faith is from zero to 10 and they, and they move while they're associated with your congregation from a six to a seven or a seven to an eight. That is that is making loving disciples. It is totally making loving disciples. Perfectly in line with what God wants us to do. Perfectly in line. It is not a numbers game. It's a combination of how many people are associated with the congregation that are growing in their faith, and whether or not you have a pipeline of people growing in their faith. And and um, and. Communities change, the people who are in congregations change, and the congregation should never be afraid to make the changes necessary to keep the congregation healthy and moving forward to make loving disciples. I have offered to the, every time we make a big, big budget change, I always offer to the board, it's like, I had a great career as an engineer. I could be an engineer part-time, I could be a pastor part-time. You know, I've, if, if things don't work out, if we take this leap of faith and things don't work out, it's okay by me. We will survive, all right? Um, we also have land that is sitting there vacant that we could sell. I don't really, we shouldn't because it's a very, very valuable piece of land. Maybe not right now, but in the future. If you look at the demographics and a whole bunch of stuff in Vail, that is a very valuable piece of land. So we tell LCEF, listen, this is a big bunch, this is a big step of faith, but if it doesn't work out, we have this whole piece of land that we can sell you and give to you. But LCEF, which is our bank, says, you know what? Things are going well in your congregation. We're not, we don't need that land right now. So 
Um, I am excited. I am totally excited about how God has positioned us as a congregation to maximize incredible things that are going, the ministries, the MOPS ministries, the school ministry, the, the, the youth, the children. I mean, just everything that we are doing in our congregation. And where we lack, where we lack uh, is my inexperience. I, I, I spent 20 years as an engineer, so I have run the congregation with my engineering brain. And it's taken me about 15 years to understand that you there are some good things from an engineering brain, but you also have to have your pastor brain. And it's taken me the last 15 years to form my pastor brain. But I believe that we are just right now so blessed to move forward in our congregation to be an uh, incredible, incredible beacon of hope uh, and life-changing connection to Christ in the Vail community. So, uh, and it just requires, all Christ requires of us. He doesn't even have an end game. He just wants us to use the resources that we've been given to make loving disciples. It's that simple. Hey, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for, oh, this beautiful day. Thank you for this time together. And thank you for leading us uh, into your kingdom. Help us to be good stewards. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so thank you for joining me today, and may God richly bless you for the rest of the day. Um, go out and enjoy the sunshine, huh? We'll talk to you later. Bye.